Hello, everyone. Welcome to Maiden at Rhythm Heaven, Sunku's synthesis of J-pop and games. I'm Sebastian, uh, he and they pronouns. Um, also go by Darvo Prower. That's what I introduced myself as in my panel yesterday. Um, and uh, yeah, in this panel, we're going to be taking a look at uh, the Rhythm Heaven series and its uh, producer, uh, Sunku, and uh, how some musical concepts and his other music relate to uh, the Rhythm Heaven game. With me, I have my co-panelist, Chance. Hi, I'm Chance. Uh, I use he, him, or they, them. And um, uh, so basically, uh, we've uh, known each other for about three years now. And one of the first things that we bonded over when we first met was the fact that uh, Seb is a huge fan of Rhythm Heaven. And while I had never played Rhythm Heaven before when we met, I was very familiar with the creator, uh, Sunku, uh, because I am a huge fan of Japanese idols. So as we kind of um, like showed each other stuff from our respective sides of Sunku, so to speak, we noticed a lot of interesting connections between the work. And surprisingly enough, there's actually not a lot of overlap between those two fan bases. So we thought it would be really fun to do a panel and kind of show what we learned by doing that. Yep, so we're going to give you a quick uh, biography of Sunku and his work outside of Rhythm Heaven, a quick rundown of the Rhythm Heaven series, and then highlight several examples of uh, common concepts between the two. Um, but the first thing we're going to do is, just in case any of you wandered in here without uh, total literacy at Rhythm Heaven, give an overview of the game series. Uh, Unlike most music games, the soundtrack for Rhythm Heaven is entirely original, and rather than a consistent mini-game being played against different backing tracks, uh, there are hundreds of different uh, individual mini-games that uh, have crazy WarioWare-esque stuff happening in them while the music is playing and you're doing stuff in sync with the games. So the video I'm gonna show right here is the uh, final remix of the most recent game in the series, Rhythm Heaven Mega Mix. And uh, these remixes are where multiple of these individual mini games are played at once against a more complicated backing track, typically. This one in particular is just a medley of several mini games that uses uh, their original themes. So if you're not super familiar or need a refresher on the sound of the series, uh, this is to provide that. This is actually Sunku singing, pitched up. And uh, this goes on for about another two minutes, uh, but I think you get the general idea. I mostly wanted to show the frog hop example with the Sunku singing. And uh, with that, we're gonna move on to our quick biography of Sunku. Yeah, so yeah. So basically, we're going to start by kind of giving a, a, as brief of a, as I can give overview of Sunku and his career. Uh, so. Who is Sungu? Well, his real name is Mitsuo Tarada. He was born in Japan in 1968. 
And so when he was growing up in the 70s, he would listen to a lot of American and European music on the radio. Um, and so he would basically say later in his career that his biggest musical influences were the Beatles and Queen, as well as disco acts such as the Bee Gees and Casey and the Sunshine Band. Um, and another really important thing to know about Sungu is that he is very, very serious about music. Um, he really like envisions himself as a serious rock star. Um, and he actually says in his autobiography that at the beginning of his career, he hated pop music. And he would go out of his way to avoid listening to it. And whenever he did end up hearing it by accident, he would get upset and be like, oh, I can't believe this is what's popular right now. Which is very funny considering what happens after that. So, uh, moving along. So, this is Saron Q. So, that was a band in the 90s that Sungu was actually the lead singer for. So they formed in 1988. Uh, the five original members of the band were all students at the same university in, um, in the Kansai region of Japan. And the name came from the names of three bands that the members were in previously. So you have the Sha from Shutters, um, and it, sa it says Shu there, but when you write it in Japanese, it, it's a Sha. So, and then Ra and Q. So you put those all together to make Sharon Q. Um, so they played for, for about four years until they signed with a major management company uh, called Upfront and they moved to Tokyo to release their major debut song in 1992. Now, their first couple years were, they had like a little bit of a rough start after their major debut. They, their sales were just not doing so well. Um, and they actually almost had their record contract terminated. Um, and we have a quote about that, about when they had their first hit. Um, this is from Suzuki's autobiography, Jakarai Ikuru. Um, he said, as we were on the verge of having our record deal terminated, uh, when we released our fourth single, Jokyo Monogatari, which means Tokyo Story, and we finally managed to sell in excess of 50,000 copies, we felt so happy. The single ended up selling 130,000 copies in total, and little by little, we were able to start playing live, playing live more. Uh, but on the other side of that happiness, I felt frustration. I had written neither the lyrics nor the music of Jokyo Monogatari, uh, up until then, I'd always written one of the two out of all of our songs, but I had had nothing to do with this one. I decided in my heart that our next hit would be one of my songs. And long story short, that is actually what happened. Um, their next uh, fifth single, Sinku wrote the lyrics for, and that ended up doing pretty well. But it wasn't until their sixth single, which was also written by Sinku, um, that was the one that really hit it big and sold a million copies. And after that, they just had like a string of like huge hits. Um, including Zuri Ona, which is the song that you're listening to right now. Um, so, by 1997, uh, Sharon Q's popularity had started slowing down a little bit, and Suki started discussing with the president of Upfront up what they wanted to do with the future of Sharon Q. And while they were in those discussions, they were actually produced, they were, sorry, they were actually approached by the producers of Asayan, which was a Japanese reality uh, talent competition. And basically every season, they would have some kind of theme contest for female singers or idols to take part in. So they basically said, hey, would you, would you and Sharon Q like to produce our, it will help produce our next season. And so they decided to have an audition to uh, have, get an additional female singer for Sharon Q. Um, and so, they held these auditions, and six finalists were chosen, and they performed the song Get, which you're hearing right now, um, and that's a song written by Sungu. Now, before before this, Sungu had actually never produced music for other artists before. He had only ever written songs for himself and, uh, and like, his own band. So, but during this, the process of this audition, he actually found that he really liked writing music for other people. And so the winner of that audition was uh, Michi Oheke, who, and that is why she has the official music video for the song that you're watching right now. Um, however, there were still those five runners-up, the other five finalists, 
And he decided on the spot that he would form an idol group with those five girls, which went on to become Morning Moose Men. Um, so, basically, for some reason, uh, Michi Ohege never actually ended up singing for Sharon too. She ended up debuting as a soloist instead. But those six girls became the foundation of what would become Hello Project, which is a Japanese idol umbrella that was, at the time, managed entirely by Sumi. And long story short, they got huge. Um, at first, they were kind of like Sumi's like side project, but uh, around 1999, they suddenly got really popular. And around the same time, uh, the other members of Saram Q were kind of wanting to pursue their own solo projects as well. And so they went on indefinite hiatus in the year 2000. So, like I said, um, Hello Project got huge. So it basically just kept growing and they kept adding more and more girls and groups and so you had to write music for all of them. Um, and you can actually see in this music video right here, there are 47 girls in this music video. This was a single uh, that had every member of Hello Project at that time. Um, and to talk about why Hello Project was so successful, um, I have to talk a little bit about how idols generally work in Japan. And see, the thing with uh, Japanese idol singers is that the point is more about selling the girls than it is about selling music. So it's not necessarily that idol music is usually bad, it's just that producing quality music isn't really the point of idols. It's not going to be the top priority. But, like we said before, Juju is very, very serious about music. Uh, so we actually have a quote here. Uh, he says, uh, also from his autobiography, however, no matter what sort of circumstances I was working under, the one thing I never compromised on was the sound. The lyrics, music, arrangement, recording, overdubbing, mixing, mastering, I always continue to be very picky about all of it. Because that's what rock is all about. Even if two chords are in complete dissonance with each other, it doesn't matter as long as it sounds cool. I refuse to compromise on anything music related if it goes against my rock philosophy. That is why I say that I don't make idol music, even if what I make is sung by people who decide to make all idols. That is the one thing I'm convinced of. I really like the people who society may call idols. <laughs> yeah. Um, so basically, um, the attitude that Shinku really carries through all of his work is that if, there, if he is involved, if there is music involved, he is going to make sure it is damn good music. And I think you'll find that he really that that attitude shows up in a lot of his other work as well. Uh, and the other thing is that, that made that so impressive is that like, you can see like all of these girls on the street, like it was like 50 something girls, they're all in groups, some of them are soloists. They were all releasing several singles a year. Each of those singles had two original songs and a lot of them were releasing albums yearly as well. He was writing so much music at the time. Um, so, moving along, by um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the cultural impact, because um, even though Hello Project is a relatively obscure fandom, they have still had so much cultural impact that even if you've never heard of them, you have probably seen like at least one thing that they were somehow involved in. And I'm just gonna go through a few examples here. First, we have uh, the dramatic chipmunk meme, which um, that was actually originally from a variety show that um, uh, Mini Moni, which was a subgroup of Morning Musume, was on. Uh, I don't know the exact context that the chipmunk appeared in, but that is the origin of it. Uh, there's the anime Shugo Chara, which I don't think Sunku wrote all of the songs for it, but all of the openings and endings for it were performed by Hello Project groups. Um, this is a screenshot from a video that is um, that got pretty popular, like outside of specifically the Hello Project fandom. This was from a variety show that Morning Musume was on, where they were doing English lessons, and it's just very it, it just comes up a lot as like one of those like funny Japanese people speak English videos. Um, and I've actually had multiple people multiple people send me that video before and go like, oh, you like J-pop? Do you recognize these girls? And I was like, yeah, actually, I, I do. <laughs> 
And then uh, we also have Hamtaro. Sunku wrote a lot of songs for the Hamtaro anime, and there were also a bunch of characters who were based on Hello Project idols. Uh, pictured here, we have the mini hams, who were hamster versions of Mini Moni, who I also mentioned in the context of the dramatic chipmunk. Lots of rodents with Mini Moni. <laughs> and then um, last, we have. Um, this image, which went viral about 10 years ago, uh, this was two members of Morning Musume on a variety show where they were asked to write the names of numbers in English. And I, I, just, I really like this. Uh, 10, 10, 10. <laughs> That's really how it should be written. My favorite is full. Full. <laughs> uh, so continuing along there. Um, so by 2004, uh, the popularity of Hello Project had slowed down a little bit. And just like back in 1997, Suku started thinking about what he wanted to do next. Um, so one of the things he did was he got married. Uh, his wife is a former, uh, former model named Hanako. Um, another thing he did was he had some like, weird side projects during these years. Um, for example, in the Hello Project, they branched out into like they founded like a Kansai branch, which, like I said, is another regional Japan. Um, they also um, they also tried expanding into other Asian countries. Like they produced like a Taiwanese group, they produced a Chinese group. I think they held auditions in Korea at one point. That didn't really go anywhere. Um, but during that time, he also made Rhythm Heaven, which we will obviously talk about a little more later. Um, and then around that time, uh, another thing that's important to note is that as Hello Project had got bigger, um, there, it, it, there came a point where Suku wasn't able to realistically manage every single thing anymore. So because of that, um, it became a little more prone to corporate meddling, which I will talk a little bit more about anyway. But that was what led Suku to found um, his own subsidiary under upfront, TNX. And TNX is where you will find uh, most or maybe even all of the artists that did music for the heaven. And one of those artists was the possible song you can see right here. Um, and they did a bunch of songs for Rhythm Heaven. Uh, they were like a six-member group. They changed their name to Chow Bella Chichetti in 2015 for some reason. I think because the possible is like impossible to find in Google search. <laughs> um, but anyway. So next um, this is the sad part of the presentation. So in 2014 uh, he um, he, he talked on his blog about how he had been undergoing treatment for throat cancer. And long story short, basically the cancer was there and it went into remission and then it came back, but ultimately it was decided that the only way to beat the cancer permanently was to remove his vocal cords. And I, I, I mean, I just cannot even imagine how devastating that is for a, like, not only a singer, but also a producer who needs to record demos for all of the songs and for the people. Um, so around that time, uh, he also stepped down as the general manager of Hello Project. Um, you would think it was because of the illness, but uh, the reason he actually cited was creative differences. Uh, there were, uh, he just felt that his, his, his vision for what he wanted Hello Project to be wasn't compatible with what Upfront wanted, so he decided to step down. Um, and in 2016, he actually moved to Hawaii with his family, and since then, he has been traveling back and forth between Japan and Hawaii, except I assume he has not been doing that very much in the last couple of years, for obvious reasons. Um, and so, next, uh, that brings us to now. What, what is he up to? Um, he does still produce music. Uh, he still writes most of the music for Morning Musume, he st and he'll occasionally write songs for the other Hello Project groups um, and other artists as well. Um, this is a song from Morning Musume's most recent single, and I promise it's going to pick up in a second. Um, then, actually, I think this song is some of his best work in quite a while. Uh, we also, uh, he also has an active online presence. So he has a blog that he updates regularly. He posts on Twitter. He has a YouTube channel. So if you speak Japanese or can use Google Translate, it's not too hard to find out what he's up to if you really want to. Um, another fun thing is um, last year he wrote a song for Hello Kitty. And I do mean that Hello Kitty. I didn't know she sang before that. 
Um, so, yeah, so she basically, uh, she posted the song on her YouTube channel, uh, the one that Suki wrote for her, but she also did a cover of a Mori Musume song called The Peace, which you guys might hear a little of later. Who knows? Um, and then another cool thing, um, this isn't strictly something that Sungu did, but it is very recent and also very cool, so we're going to mention it anyway. Yeah, so a couple months ago, he uh, announced on his blog that he's actually been the secret ID, uh, identity of Chainsaw Man from Chainsaw <laughs> Man. Okay, so what's really happening here is um, the producer, Mappa, who uh, did the soundtrack for Chainsaw Man, he actually sampled lyrics from a song that Sungu wrote for Morning Musume. Um, and we have a video uh, showing the comparison. <laughs> He has a whole blog post that has a pretty good translation about this. And he was just talking about how like he picked the songs for this because he wanted like uplifting words that were the right number of syllables. So it's yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah he actually it, uh, he actually samples other lyrics from that song as well, but that's just like the most obvious example, and we didn't want to have spend that much time on it. And now I'm gonna pass it over to you. All right. So moving on to the rhythm heaven side of things. Um, Chance was mentioning that he was looking in, into a lot of uh, experimental side projects in 2005, 2006, and one of those was presumably uh, Rhythm Heaven. Uh, something interesting about the original uh, genesis of Rhythm Heaven was that Sunku just like wrote to Nintendo with his idea of making the first good rhythm game because all the other ones like don't have very meaningful connections between uh, the music and the inputs. Uh, and Nintendo took him up on that offer. Uh, another interesting thing about the concept behind Rhythm Heaven is because he's, as always, serious about music, uh, he envisioned it as almost like an educational tool, tool to improve your music literacy and uh, give you a sense of rhythm. This mission statement is explicit in the uh, fully English lyrics to the first minigame in the series, even though that was in uh, Japan-only release. the player hey baby listen to my face i can give you a sense of rhythm and uh here's a excerpt from an uh, interview with uh, iwata asks and I'm gonna, uh, uh, yeah, he, he officially considers the series to be disseminating a sense of rhythm uh so that is a very explicit mission statement it could really have worked if you guys popped it so the team at Nintendo that actually uh, developed the Rhythm Heaven series is Nintendo SPD-1. They're probably most well-known for their work on the WarioWare series alongside Intelligent Systems. Uh, one of the later games in that series, uh, Game & Wario, actually explicitly referenced uh, Rhythm Heaven Mega Mix, or not the, the series, uh, Rhythm Heaven Fever was the most recent at that time, uh, with the wrestler and interviewer showing up in the credits for that game. Um, Something else they worked on that is related to Rhythm Heaven is uh, they had a GBA uh, MP3 player called the Playon, and it had this little mascot who shows up also in the um, 3DS's MP3 player visualizer. And uh, this character is playable in the original version of uh, Nightwalk. And uh, here's the redesign from Mega Mix. Uh, switched out for uh, Marshall in Rhythm Heaven Fever, which is where I think a lot of the Western fan base would first have played Nightwalk. But started with play on and uh yeah in the most recent rhythm heaven game mega mix one of the final challenges you unlock is actually called wario where 
and uh, it features several uh, of the mini games with uh, appropriate Wario characters switched in. I particularly think that the uh, tiny Wario for the fast triplet racers is an inspired choice. Uh, this doesn't directly pertain to Rhythm Heaven, but I think it's worth mentioning. Nintendo SPD1 also made the um, Tomodachi Collection games, uh, localizes Tomodachi Life, and uh, it just like goes to show this was the group that was like making everything good and quirky uh, for Nintendo at that time. Now they unfortunately uh, did some reorganization after the passing of Iwata, but um, the we got a WarioWare game pretty recently, and that didn't seem like it was given, so uh, still holding out hope for at least a Mega Mix port for the Switch. Uh, I'm going to do increasingly desperate bargaining as I go through this section. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, an interesting little anecdote about the development for the first Rhythm Tengoku uh, is that Sunku was unsatisfied with some of the early demos that were sent back to him by the development team to uh, the music tracks he provided them and decided the best thing to do was to uh, force him to uh, force those developers to learn how to dance and actually give them a sense of rhythm because they weren't understanding what was wrong with the games they were sending back to him. Watch this clip while doing research. I recognize that character. That is a whole project practice group that I recognize from like other videos that I've seen. Them. And uh, now I am going to list every single official Rhythm Heaven release because unfortunately there are few enough of those that I can do that in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, <laughs> the first game in the series was of course Rhythm Tengoku for the Game Boy Advance. That was Japanese exclusive. But uh, every other game in the series uh, after that got uh, localized to at least three other regions. Um, the original Rhythm Tengoku actually got an arcade port, and uh, that is in the MAGFest arcade. I recommend you check that out if you haven't played it before. Oh, no. Oh, man. That sucks. Uh, F. And, uh, yeah, the first uh, worldwide release in the series was uh, Rhythm Tengoku Gold, localized just as Rhythm Heaven, uh, Tengoku effectively translates to heaven and paradise, which is why those are the English translations of that. Um, it was localized as Rhythm World in South Korea. Something interesting, I think this is the only version that has Korean versions, but uh, there's a full English vocal soundtrack and a full Korean soundtrack for the uh, vocal tracks in this game. And um, there's even some like minor changes between versions so that the differences in lyrics uh, don't result in like the Japanese rhythm having inputs where they wouldn't make sense for the other languages. And Sunku was very deliberate about making sure that uh, the actual intent of the game was not compromised in the localization proce process, which is probably why it took so long. A lot of rhythm games you could just slap the same soundtrack or find popular songs from the other regions. Uh, another thing I wanted to point out here, the reason the European box is biggest here is because it was part of the Touch Generations series, which was uh, uh, around the middle of the original DS's lifespan. They started doing that to uh, categorize the brain age and uh, more casual puzzle game type things, but it had educational connotations and I think it's interesting it got explicitly listed as one of those there. Uh, the same logo did show up on some uh, US uh, DS box arts. So I'm, I'm not sure what the decision making process was there, but little factoid. Uh, the next game in the series was uh, Mina no Rhythm Tengoku. That literally just means everyone's Rhythm Heaven. Um, and the logic behind that name 
which is pretty different from Rhythm Heaven Fever, is that as opposed to the DS version where a single person would be playing it on a relatively small screen, if you have this up on the TV, your family who might not have any experience with rhythm games might say, oh, why are you making all these mistakes? I could do better and try that out, uh, see how hard it actually is. Uh, you'll notice I only have uh, two box arts for Rhythm Heaven Fever on screen right now. It's because the this next one needs a little bit of focus for itself. Uh, in Europe, it was localized as Beat the Beat Rhythm Paradise. Uh, that Beat the Beat thing is like 80% of the logo. They added amps to the like black circles that are constant throughout the logo. They doing some fun stuff in the PAL regions. <laughs> um, an interesting thing about that game is that it actually has both the English and Japanese uh, versions of the vocal tracks, and you can switch between them. Um, and then in uh, South Korea, the uh, Rhythm World uh, title was preserved, and it was just called Rhythm World Wii, which is basic, but to the point. And uh, finally, we have uh, Rhythm Heaven, the best, Rhythm Tengoku, the best plus, localizes Rhythm Heaven Mega Mix. You'll notice that I don't have box art for the US version of uh, Rhythm Heaven Mega Mix. So, like, I don't know, six, eight months after uh, the best plus released, and there was no word on like any kind of localization, I imported a Japanese 3DS and physical copy of that. And then, like, unceremoniously, like a month or so before release, there was a direct, was like, oh, yeah, this is. This is coming out, and uh, for some reason, the U.S., they just were like, eh, let's not bother giving this a physical release. And then there's a lot of hearsay about uh, the poor sales being why the series didn't continue, but um, I had to make this placeholder due to the lack of official box art for the U.S. version. <laughs> uh, a little salty about that still. <laughs> uh, Megamix actually only introduced one new vocal track, which I believe is English in all regions. Uh, it was also the only track to be released as a single or any kind of official soundtrack outside the game. And that is I'm a Lady Now from the Honeybee remix. So right now I have both uh, of these audios unmuted, um, just so you can hear it with the sound effect. But I'm going to use the remix after we've gone through all the games at least once to just show how much of the original song was intended to work with this kind of thing. So, um, yeah, Hot Smike is the performer here, and there's an interview where Suku's just like, yeah, she's young, but she has a really good grasp on English and a uh, powerful voice. So, like, this is his daughter. He just doesn't mention that in the interview, like, ever the uh, professional. And uh, now for the uh, most uh, desperate pleading part of... Uh, <laughs> Suku is very active on social media, and some of that has uh, included recently retweeting um, 
people saying they want a rhythm heaven for the Switch, uh, with basically calls to action like at Nintendo about this. Let's uh, tell people at Nintendo that we'll buy this. And uh, I have a comment from uh, Jan Misely, who's a really good Rhythm Heaven content creator uh, down there as well. Be the only game I play for the next 50 years too. And uh, Sunku is really cool. He like retweets uh, fan projects like the Rhythm Heaven reanimated as well, which is not how every Nintendo IP holder would respond to fan content Certainly to say the not. least. Um, but yeah, this is the official call to action. Uh, be more annoying about social media, like share custom remixes, uh, try to convince Nintendo it would be profitable for them to make another one because it's been too long. And uh, yeah, so with that, um, moving on to some of the specific commonalities between uh, the games, the music, Weird. what is it? Huh. Ah. <laughs> Sorry. That was probably from another room. Um, so yeah, a, a common theme in the mini games of Rhythm Heaven is a call and response between um, your character responding to uh, instructor or authority figure, or like any sort of um, peer even. Uh, yeah. Um, so the games that are like this, uh, by my arbitrary <laughs> definition, are Rap Men, Rhythm Rally, Moai Doo Wop, uh, Love Lizards, DJ School, Drummer Duel, Love Lab, uh, Rockers, Seesaw, Tambourine, Working Doe, um, Air Rally, Love Rap, and First Contact. And pretty much all of these games either have you like literally copying back what somebody else is showing you, uh, or in some cases responding in a repeatable way to a uh, specific prompt. So one interesting example out of this type of game in particular is Love Rap. I'm gonna let that play a little bit. And uh, notice the plane landing in the background and the fence and the car and the outfit. Yeah, because um, the thing is, when we were playing Rhythm Heaven Fever, uh, while, uh, while preparing for this panel, um, I actually into noticed you, while, uh, while uh, they were playing this game that I this was into very familiar you, to me, you. and I realized that this entire, I'm pretty sure this entire mini game is a reference into to, you, a, into a, to a song that Suku wrote in uh, 2003. Um, it's a song by Mini Modi. There's some from Mini Modi Morning this way I uh, mentioned before. But look, there's the plane flying overhead. They're in the car. Um, you're gonna see um, when it starts. Like I they have like similar like outfits. One of them has like the like the same me. shades. Um, and the, the song also has rap in it. I'm just gonna let it go. This is true or not, right? And also just sounds good. I didn't even realize until we were practicing last night the plane taking off at the start. I thought I messed up the animation and Love Rap was starting again because I didn't realize this video just starts in that same specific way. So the other common theme uh, with pretty obvious parallels to idle performances is uh, synchronization when you're one of many uh, little characters doing something in unison. Uh, th this alone, I think, is like the theme of at least a quarter of all of the mini games and this and the previous group together is more than a third um, which is interesting when you keep it by there's the more famous stuff like the wrestling interview at fork uh, lifter where a fork is stabbing peas and it doesn't really have any clear relation to anything other than funny visuals uh, but you have marchers the clappy trio rat race the bonadori um, space dance Tap Trial, Glee Club, Fan Club, Bluebirds, The Dazzles, 
Splashdown, Big Rock Finish, Frog Hop, Lockstep, Air Borders, Board Meeting, Micro Row, Flipper Flop, uh, Flock Step, uh, mm -hmm. see, um, not see Donk Donk, uh, Donk Donk, donk um, Tap Troop, uh, Shrimp Shuffle, which I have a brief anecdote about. Uh, th this game is an uh, untranslatable pun in Japanese. Um, it's called Ebi C. Ebi is the Japanese word for shrimp, and C is the English word for ocean. And like the result screens have like a big capital C superimposed over them that are only the Japanese version as a result. But uh, shrimp, sh shrimp Shuffle has good alliteration, yeah, too. Yeah, so basically they say ABC during the song, and it's called ABC. <laughs> uh, you have Cheerleaders, uh, Sumo Brothers, Pajama Party, and Kitties, and yeah, all those, you're either doing things at the same time or with, like, a really rapid da da da. And uh, one example that kind of defies classification is bossa nova this has elements of both of those other ones you're kind of doing the same thing as the other character here but i'll let the video play and you can see what's going on yeah. so the interesting thing about bossa nova is that there are two rhythms happening One, simultaneously two, three, in this song and uh you and uh, the other little guy over there are kind don't, of switching back and forth don't. between which one of the two rhythms you're doing and um while it's not exactly the uh, Shuku actually did something really similar in uh, another song that he wrote, uh, Kaneshiki Heaven, which is, um, it is a duet that's sung almost entirely in harmony, and the two singers actually uh, switch back and forth between which part of the harmony that they're singing. So we actually have a clip for that as well. And now back to the high part. And it's the other and then goes high. Again low and this is the part put together. And that is, in my opinion, one of the best duets ever written. Um, another thing, um, another cool way that um, Sunku's idol music has kind of influenced his game design is um, there's something called Wotage, which is kind of these like choreographed dance moves that um, idol fans will do while watching a performance. Um, one of the most famous examples of Wotage is actually um, is actually for a song Sunku wrote called Romantic Party Mode. It was performed by a soloist on the whole project. And you can see them kind of doing this here. Fan Club, which is a game that is very explicitly about doing Wotage. Yeah, it's, uh... And uh, we have to, we didn't edit the video. Well, we were debating putting the training in, but the actual performance, I think, gives you the idea pretty well. Yeah. Let's, uh... Oop. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey now, here is my song for you. Yeah. I think that what noise is actually used in fan club too as well as I think so, yeah. alternate prompt. Uh, and then another thing that uh, you see a lot in uh, Rhythm Heaven mini games is these kind of vocal cues that give you a hint at like what you're supposed to do next in the game. Uh, I think my favorite example is Air Rally, the ba 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 ba, and. Um, Suku does this a lot in the songs he writes. Like it is hard to like put into words just how much it happens. So we actually put together this video clip. Hey yo, when I Yeah. <laughs> 
sometimes seem to use uh, vocalizations or visualize as a extra character. And he also voiced this animated Santa in a music video. I, I like the visual effect of him like pointing the remote at the fourth wall as the video ends. Um, so, um, how to learn more. Um, Hello Project Music is infamously not on Spotify. Um, it's kind of a meme in the fandom to try to, <laughs> to see, like, when is it going to happen, you guys? Uh, but we do have a QR code over there, um, and that is a playlist of all of the songs that we used in this presentation, if you wanted to see that. Um, and then the other a fun thing that I learned, Sharon Q, uh, Sunku's band from the beginning of the presentation, they are on Spotify, and they have some really good stuff if you do want to check that out. Um, you can stream Hello Project on Apple Music uh, if you have a Japanese account. <laughs> um, but for a lot of stuff, um, there's also official YouTube channels of uh, the current and some of the former artists. But unfortunately, for a lot of the older stuff, the only legal way to obtain it is by importing physical copies. Um, you, um, in the US, you can actually buy on Japanese Amazon now. Uh, there's also CD Japan, which I bought stuff on before. Um, and, and yeah, thank you guys so much. This is really great. Uh, we have like kind of stuff coming through. And we have I think there's actually one more example. Um, oh, so, right, I forgot. Uh, somewhat infamously in uh, Remix 10 for Rhythm Heaven Fever. Uh, oh, it does speak for itself. Double up. You're going to have trouble clapping along with this uh, next Three, segment. Two, one, yeah. It's really long, so we sped through most of it. <laughs> Oh, you're still trying. <laughs> so it's partially included because it's funny, but partially to just emphasize how much you had to do perfectly to get to the end of this on the perfect street. And right here is where the original Packing Test song would end. And as a medley, you'd think, okay. Oh, cheeky extra verse. That, that's how they get you. Oh, shit. <laughs> but uh, there is actually um, another song. It, it's very funny to me that Remix 10 was showing the screen with the two fans. <laughs> yeah. I really, uh... And they have to run back onto the set. <laughs> All right, now for the real final slide, uh, our, yeah. our plugs. Yeah, um, so I actually do run a Discord server for talking about Hello Project. Um, I've been running it since 2016. I have a QR code for it right there. Um, and then we also have our social media. Um, the Twitter account is um, my Hello Project Twitter account, which is not very active, but I put it there anyway. But uh, there's also my Discord account if you want to message me. Yep, and uh, yeah, I think that's actually it. Uh, yeah. Anyone have any questions, any other anecdotes about either Sunku or Rhythm Heaven they want to share? Sure. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I think we did look at some of the live performances of the songs. I think we just kind of just didn't end up finding a good place to put them in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know that, um, I don't know about fan club, but uh, the song Boko no, no Jidai, uh, also translated as uh, Dreams of Our Generation, um, three of the original singers from that actually ended up get, being moved over to Hello Project after uh, TN, the TNX groups kind of dissolved in 2014. Um, and they, they are actually, um, two of the three are in groups that are actually still active. Let's see. Yeah. Honestly, I'm not super curious about the Hello Project. So I'm curious, how close, other than obviously the covers, is the rhythm and the music to the Hello Project? Uh, um, I mean, it very it's very clearly made by the same person, I would say. Sunku does things with like synthesizer settings that I have never heard anywhere else. And when yeah. Chance was first showing me just some of the Hello Project uh, discography, I was like, oh, wait, this just sounds like Rhythm Heaven without any specific melodic yeah. reason. Just that like very uh, reverb heavy, digitized, synthy. Main yeah, there were literally a couple moments like while we were like going over songs to include in the slideshow that you literally were just like, oh my god, why is Suku the only person good at producing music? Uh -huh. <laughs> like, the only Let's see, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, uh, well, thank you for coming though. Well, I was going to mention that there was actually um, a GTA game of Rhythm Heaven. Yes. Yep. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Um, let's see. Did see, I, I think you had your yeah, hand. Yeah, you had your hand up for a little bit, yeah. Yeah, um, what about how in uh, the original band Love and there was like the big band that was like the appearance of the singer was based on like a specific idol saying the song or something, and then when they read the different they had to change their appearance to be based on a different idol? Yeah, um, I do know what you're talking about. I don't know the exact reason or who they changed it for i do know that uh for example the dazzles are based on uh the possible who um i showed a clip from earlier and it was funny because when we were actually watching the rhythm heaven iceberg video they were like yeah they changed the appearance of the dazzles in later games for some reasons and like and i know that the reason was because like they had like you know changed their like hairstyles and they wanted it to reflect their current appearance um and that was i, I found that funny yeah. Yeah. So uh, Rhythm yeah. Heaven Fever had a Japanese exclusive, um, like side game that was based on a manzai, which is a Japanese comedy routine. Um, and I did they replace that with the like Game and Watch uh, step guy or? I I forget what they replaced it with, but I think it was just. Um, Mr. Upbeat. Yeah, yeah. And that I, was I think originally they just replaced in that the... because it was just like too hard to translate or like or it just it wouldn't make sense to other people or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's generally considered to be why. Mm. Uh, anyone else? All right. Um, I think that is probably good for now. Then. Um, oh, 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 never mind. Yeah. We got we got people. <laughs> Yeah, 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 they had Beyonce in the commercial. Yeah, we never. Yeah, we didn't. We didn't find a good place to put Beyonce. <laughs> and I'm wondering, do you think that this series would ever get that sort of promotion behind it? I think I it's. I mean, I would possible. like to say yes, but uh, I doubt it. <laughs> I I kind of wonder if like they spent so much money on that. That's why they were like kind of negative in America and only had the digital release for Mega Mix later on cuz I mean I think Fever sold pretty well. I don't really the marketing decisions of Nintendo are curious at best. Uh but uh yeah, I'd like to see that kind of push again and I feel like with um a little bit less bias towards western music being popular worldwide uh or well specifically in the west it seems relatively likely to me that it could have a, another surge of popularity, but I might have a motivated reasoning. Yeah. 
it did have a kind of a resurgence in popularity in 2020 when the uh, when like the remix like custom remixes kind of became a popular meme to do. Yeah. Hi. Oh, really? Oh, cool. Oh, nice. Yeah, we we were probably watching some of your videos in our room. <laughs> yeah, we were probably. Mm -hmm. No judgment here. Yeah, a lot of this music is like basically only accessible in the U.S. by by pirating anyway. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm like, that's really cool. Yeah, I remember following along with that project as like all the resources were being, uh, yeah, uh, isolated and put together for the custom remixes. And these days they like are looking really incredible. It's very amazing compared to. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Up. Oh. Yeah. Oh, uh, that Sunku doesn't know how to hold a DS or GBA. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the, the Rhythm Heaven Iceberg has entries on, uh, like, there are pictures of Sunku, like, with the GBA micro in front of him and, like, just punching the buttons like a yeah, little just drum sitting machine. On the table. Yeah. And uh, that there was speculation that Rhythm Heaven Gold. Uh, is held sideways because he was introduced to the DS through Braid Age and just thought that was how he was supposed to hold it. <laughs> um, as far as my favorite part, oh man, it's hard to say. There, there was a lot of really interesting stuff in there. They, uh, there were a few parts where they went into like really complicated like music music theory stuff on like how certain mini games worked and like. Like, basically, there were a couple where they're like, hey, why is this game so hard? And they would just explain, like, I don't know anything about music theory, so it didn't make any sense to me, but I did think it was really cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Rhythm Dungeon. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's see. All right. Well, I think we'll clear out yeah. for... Next panel. Right, thank, thank you, you guys so much so for coming. Much. This was really fun.